God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Don't you feel lifted up after that? Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to hearing Noel sing in phase two. So the, the ceiling in that building is twice the height of this ceiling. So that's going to be awesome. Thank you, Noel. And uh, thank you for blessing us. Keep singing for the Lord. It's uh, tremendous. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I want to talk with you this morning about we have a good, good father. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, while you find your way there, just want to say thank you again for your prayers and for your giving towards phase two. Uh, we had a very productive week this week. All the plumbing uh, was completed. Uh, that's going to go underneath the building. It was inspected and we passed the inspections. And so now they're just prepping the site. Uh, tomorrow we're expecting the concrete contractor back on site to begin putting up the forms for the basement walls. So uh, by about the 1st of September, we've been all horizontal this whole time. Now we're going to go vertical. So and uh, going to start seeing the basement of the building coming together. And I want to just give thanks to the Lord because we received a very significant gift this last week for phase two towards our jump in campaign. So. <clears throat> I'm on, a, I'm on a mission to frustrate the Assemblies of God as long as I can by not borrowing any of their money and just uh, paying cash for the new building. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your giving and keep on praying for us. All right, look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Going to begin reading in verse 2 and we want to talk for a few minutes about we have a good, good father. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 starting in verse 2. Two. Paul, speaking to his children, the Lord, says, Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I don't say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we live for you and we would die for you. I have boldly spoken great things about you. I boast about you. I'm greatly encouraged. In all my troubles, my joy overflows. For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside and fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort that you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because I made you sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so you were not harmed by us in any way. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who wronged me, nor on account of my injury, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. Let's pray. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Father, thank you for this day. We feel your presence here. Father, thank you for your great love for us. I pray that you would minister to us, that we would encounter you through your word, and that you'd breathe on us. We ask in Jesus' name, if your heart agrees, say amen, amen. and amen. You know, as I grow on in years, and as I grow on in ministry, I'm learning that one of the most powerful and deeply painful emotions in the human experience is regret. Regret over missed opportunities and wasted opportunities. Regret over mistakes. Regret over bad decisions. Maybe that we made in haste, that we made on impulse, perhaps that we made in a moment of anger. 
Regret over wrongs we have done. Regret over doors that we opened that led to bondage. Regret over damage done to ourselves and over damage done to others, especially those that we love. Regret torments us. Regret haunts us. Regret stays with us to the bitter end of life. Earlier this year I sat by my dad's bedside on the last day of his life and there was a lot of regret in the room, both spoken and unspoken. Regret over decades of smoking, regret over decades of alcohol abuse, regret over lost time, lost relationships, lost opportunity to love. And beloved, here's the thing about regret. Jesus said that for those who refuse to put their trust in him, regret continues on for eternity. In Luke 16, Jesus gave what I believe is the actual account of a rich man in hell. And in addition to his physical suffering, Jesus said that a large part of his torment was the mental and emotional anguish of regret. I have to tell you the truth, it always bothers me deeply when believers comment on the death of an unbeliever and they say, rest in peace. Mm. Beloved, listen to me. To leave this earthly life without Jesus is the most horribly catastrophic thing that could ever happen to anyone. They will not rest in peace. Instead, those who perish without Christ will exist forever in the anguish of of regret. Old blue eyes crooned that his regrets were too few to mention but people who die without Christ will surely croon a different tune. Regret is one of the most powerfully punishing emotions in life and in death but thanks be to God there is a remedy for regret. There is relief from the pain of regret. There is a way to remove the burden of regret and to remove it permanently. And Paul tells us how in these verses. Looking at 2 Corinthians 7, I see four truths that lead to the removal of regret. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Four truths that lead to the removal of regret. The first truth is this. We have a good, good father. In 2 Corinthians 7, once again, Paul pours out his heart of love for his spiritual children. He says, you have such a deep place in our hearts that we live for you and we would die for you. We brag about you. We boldly say great things about you. You bring us joy. You bring us comfort. Now here's the thing. Paul's love for his spiritual children is not his own. Rather, it is the Father's love in him. You might remember that Paul was once a fierce hater of the church. He was once a violent persecutor of Christians. Luke says Saul had killer breath. He was breathing out murderous threats against lovers of Christ. But then Jesus arrested Saul on the Damascus road and God lavishly poured his love into Saul's heart by the Holy Spirit. So Paul's expressions of love here in 2 Corinthians 7 are really expressions of the Father's love. How Paul loved his children is precisely how the Father loved them and it's precisely how the Father loves us. From Paul's words here, it's easy to see that we have a good, good father. Look at how he loves us. Do you know that he brags on you? Paul sent Titus to visit Corinth for the very first time, but before Titus left, Paul bragged on the Corinthians. He said, Titus, you're going to love them. You're going to love their passion for the Lord in worship. You're going to love their affectionate, teachable hearts. You're going to love their hospitality. 
The irony is that there was some really serious messes between Paul and the Corinthians going on that were unresolved, but that didn't change Paul's affection for his children in the Lord, and it didn't stop Paul from bragging on them. He said, we boldly speak great things about you, we brag on you. When Titus returned to Paul with a good report about the Corinthians, Paul said, Phew. he said, I'm so glad I bragged so much on you and you didn't embarrass me. Can I tell you that as a dad, I totally relate to the father's love that Paul is expressing here. I'm proud of my kids and I like to brag on them. In fact, I think I will for a minute. <laughs> Do you know that all three of my kids are super sharp? All three of them are in the advanced learning program in Greenwich Public Schools. You know, when our kids were first invited into that program, Denise and I didn't really know what a big deal that is. Their teachers recommended them and we said, sure, we'll, we'll give it a whirl. And then these super regressive alpha male dog Greenwich parents started approaching us. How did you get your kids in? Who do you know? What connections do you have? I tell you the truth, my entire house would fit into one of their garages and there's still room for a Ferrari or two left over. And they can't figure it out. They're storming the principal's office. They're storming the board of education trying to get their kids into the out program. And they don't know how all three of our kids got in. And we just tell him, hey, what can we say? We have a good, good father. He has a lot of influence around here. But I'm going to brag on my kids for a minute. They're very bright. All three of them read. All three of them do math and science. Many grade levels uh, above where they're at on, in school. I want to uh, brag about my firstborn son, Ben. Ben is full of life. Ben is full of energy. He's full of fun. Ben is very strong physically. Every coach that has ever had Ben loves him because he's naturally aggressive and competitive. He loves to be fast, he loves to be first, and he loves to win. And the coaches all say to me, you know, skills, they can always be learned along the way, but aggressiveness is either something you have or something you don't have, and Ben has it in spades. <laughs> Every teacher that has ever had Ben loves him because he's a great critical thinker. He, he distills information, he synthesizes, and when the class is stumbling and no one can come up with the right answer, they go to Ben. Ben is verbal. Ben is an auditory learner like me. He's a keen observer of people. He's musical. He plays the violin. He plays the guitar. He plays the piano. He's very precise with whatever he works on. He gets this from my father-in-law, this natural curiosity. He loves to know how things are made, how things work. Ben can solve a Rubik's Cube in about 30 to 45 seconds. Ben is relentlessly persevering. When he wants something, he will find a way to get it. And those of you who know him know it's true. But can I tell you, most of all, my son has a tender heart towards the Lord. He loves the Word of God. You know, between his 12th and 13th birthday, he read the entire Bible in a year. And if he can do it at 12, I know that we could do it too. I'm going to brag about Maddie, my other firstborn child, who's dying 10,000 deaths just now. <laughs> Maddie is by far the most diligent and disciplined member of our family. She is an amazing self-starter. She makes her own routines and she follows them. We never have to wake up Maddie in the morning. We never have to tell her what time to go to bed. We never have to tell her to do her homework. She just does it all on autopilot. You know, for the last two years in middle school, Maddie has received the reward for the outstanding academic student of the year, nominated by every one of her teachers. When Maddie commits to something, she works at it with all of her heart and she sees it all the way through. She pursues soccer that way. She plays the violin she plays the, and the, she plays the guitar. She's our most adventurous child. She's always the first to try new things. Friday night, she was 40 feet up in the trees in upstate Connecticut, zip lining, something none of the rest of us would do. She's really good at all kinds of crafts. She's a great baker. 
Can I have some chocolate chip cookies, please, Mad? She uh, is a loyal friend. She loves horseback riding. And since paying for lessons is a little out of our budget, she mucks stalls as a volunteer in exchange for free riding lessons. She has my sense of humor. She loves it when people trip and fall down. America's Funniest Videos is our favorite show. Maddie has a lot of common sense. She's good with money. And she's compassionate. I'm going to brag on Lauren, my third child this morning. Lolly is my ray of sunshine. She is by far the most affectionate member of our family. She likes to snuggle. She likes our family to be together. I think Lolly is also the most creative of all of us. She makes up characters and storylines. She makes up songs and dances. She plays the flute. She plays the viola. She plays the piano. She's a very quick study. She learns things fast. She's verbal. And she comes out with hilarious things moment by moment without trying to be funny. She's intuitive. She's sensitive. She's patient. She's easy to be with. Out of our three kids, Lolly is the best with a bottle of Windex, which is something dear to my heart. <laughs> and all the qualities that I love best about her are the qualities that she gets from her mama. She has a pure heart. She has integrity. She's sincere. She's inwardly strong. Now, now listen, that, that doesn't mean that, that we don't have issues that we're still working on in our house. But that doesn't mean that my kids are all done growing in character and in maturity. But I'm crazy about my kids and I'm going to brag on them anyway. I could go on and on, but I think you get the picture. See, as an earthly, imperfect dad, I like to brag on my kids. And if that's true, how much more then do you suppose that your heavenly father likes to brag on you? You know, even though there might still be some issues that you're working out, you know, he brags on you anyway. He brags on you in the musings of his own triune heart. He brags on you in the music of heaven. Do you know all of our songs are about him, but do you know his songs are about you? He brags on you in the scriptures. He brags on you to the angels. He brags on you to the saints in heaven. He brags on you to all of creation. Do you know that he even brags on you to the devil? It's true. Devil showed up in heaven for his weekly slander session and God bragged on Job. He said, look at my son Job. Look at how fine he is. There's no one like him. He brings delight to my heart. Devil showed up another week for his slander session to slander Joshua the high priest and God said, be quiet. I choose him. Satan's very name is the accuser of the brothers, but every time he shows up in heaven to remind God of your issues, he can't get a word in edgewise because your father just brags on you instead. There's my son. Look at how fine he is. I created him in his mother's womb, and then I recreated his heart in Christ, and he brings me great pleasure. There's my daughter. There's no one else on earth quite like her. She is completely unique and entirely outstanding and she brings me great joy. We have a good, good father. You know, not only does he brag on you, but do you know that you cause his joy to overflow? Listen, here's a thought that's so lofty, it almost sounds like heresy, but do you know that you add something to God? Now, Strictly speaking, it's impossible to either add or take away from God. God is perfectly complete in himself. God cannot be added to. He cannot be subtracted from. In no way can he be made any more or any less God. And yet there is a sense in which it is said that we add to him. Still speaking with the Father's heart, Paul tells his children, your fellowship, it fills me with comfort and it causes my joy to overflow. And you know, that's exactly what you do to God. In a way that really exceeds my ability to explain to you, God who exists in perfect contentment in a circle of unbroken fellowship with himself is somehow made even further content by your fellowship. And God who exists in complete joy is somehow made even more joyful by your fellowship. The prophet Zephaniah said God just can't help himself whenever he gets near you. He starts singing over you songs of joy. 
Our songs are about him. The angels' songs are about him. All creation sings to him. All the universe sings about him. But when he sings, he sings about you. And here's the point. You have a good, good father. He is cray cray about you. He goes gaga over you. He is head over heels in love with you. He's proud of you. He brags on you. He who is completely complete is somehow even more complete because of you. You bring overflowing joy to his heart. Four truths that lead to the removal of regret. The first truth is we have a good, good father. The second truth is because he's a good father, he rebukes us when we need it. It got quiet. <laughs> a serious issue came up between Paul and his spiritual children. After Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians, we, we studied that earlier this year, Paul made a disastrous trip to Corinth. During that visit, someone in the church publicly challenged Paul. Someone publicly questioned his ministry, his authority. Someone publicly humiliated and insulted Paul. And to make matters worse, the rest of the congregation just sat there on their hands and they didn't speak up for Paul. They didn't stand with Paul. Paul left Corinth and he wrote what he calls a sorrowful letter, sharply rebuking the Corinthians. And he sent Titus to deliver that letter. But listen, the rebuke in the letter, it wasn't Paul's rebuke, it was God's rebuke through Paul. And the reason God did it is because he is a good father. You know, Jesus said that our Father knows what we need even better than we know ourselves. He knows the provision that we need. He knows the direction that we need. He knows the protection that we need. And listen, He knows the correction that we need. He is perfect in all of His ways to us. There's a principle found all over the Bible. Listen to me. Good fathers rebuke their children and bad fathers don't. Eli was a high priest with a prophetic gift, but he was a bad earthly father. He refused to rebuke his wayward sons, which led to a tragic end to his entire family. Samuel was Eli's spiritual son. He developed his prophetic gift under Eli's tutelage, but he also grew up to become the same kind of neglectful earthly father that Eli had modeled for him. Samuel refused to rebuke his earthly sons, and it led to their tragic demise. David was Samuel's spiritual son. But he was neglected by his earthly father, Jesse. A prophet showed up in Jesse's house and said, go call all your sons. And they called everybody together and they forgot there was one more. How do you forget a kid in the pasture? <laughs> David grew up to be the same kind of neglectful earthly father. He refused to rebuke his sons and it led to their tragic end. After four generations of brokenness, David's son Solomon finally wised up and he wrote these words in Proverbs 3, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those that he loves as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. I find a few truths here about the Lord's rebuke. First of all, who does the Lord rebuke? The answer is everyone that he loves as a son or a daughter. Solomon is quoted in Hebrews 12 and then the writer of Hebrews adds these words, what son is not rebuked by his father? If you were not rebuked and everyone is rebuked, then you would be an illegitimate son and not a true son. Beloved, listen to me. If you are a son or a daughter, our good, good father, he will rebuke you. He will confront you. He will tell you, you need to change course. He'll offer direction. He'll offer correction to you. Why does the Lord rebuke us? 
Paul says some very powerful things here about why our Father rebukes us. For one thing, Paul says that the Father's purpose is not to inflict sorrow on us, but to save us from sorrow. Now listen, when people rebuke us, sometimes their goal is nothing more than to make us sorry. We made them feel awful, and so their goal is to simply return the favor, to even the score. But can I tell you, our good, good father, he is not like that. In verse 6, Paul calls him the God who comforts the downcast. It is simply not in his nature to be self-satisfied by inflicting sorrow on us. Now listen, his rebuke does make us sorrowful, but the sorrow is temporary and it is purposeful. Paul says in verse 9, my letter of rebuke made you temporarily sorrowful, but that didn't make me happy. What made me happy is that you repented. Another thing Paul says about the Father's rebuke is that his purpose is not to punish us, but it is to spare us from punishment. Paul says in verse 3, my purpose is not to condemn you. Condemn you. Verse 12, he says, I didn't write to spank the one who publicly humiliated me, but to bring you to conviction before God. A third thing that Paul says about the Father's rebuke is that his purpose is not to vindicate himself, but to vindicate us. Again, in verse 12, Paul says, I didn't write to clear my own name, but to convince you of a few things before God. Why does God rebuke us? It is not for his satisfaction, but it is for our sake. It is to make us temporarily sorry so that we won't be permanently sorry. It's to spare us from punishment, and it's for our vindication. Vindication. Whom does God rebuke? Everyone he loves. Why does God rebuke? For our own good. And how does God rebuke? You know, one way he rebukes us is through his word. Paul's letters were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The letters were not Paul's idea. They were God's idea. The words were not Paul's words, they were God's words. The authority was not Paul's authority, but God's authority. The impact of the letters was not merely psychological or emotional, but it was supernatural. God's power was in Paul's letters to confront sin, to convict hearts, and to convince people to change course. And God still uses Paul's letters that way, and all of Scripture. Paul said all scripture is inspired by God and it is productive for rebuking and correcting, for teaching and for training. How does God rebuke? Another way that God rebukes us is through spiritual fathers and mothers. God uses the people who led us to Christ. He uses the people who discipled us in Christ to speak words of confrontation and correction. God uses people with whom we have a relationship, who have his heart for us. He uses the people who teach us the word. He uses leaders in his body. He uses pastors. God uses spirit-filled sermons. He uses spirit-inspired altar calls. He uses anointed prayers. He uses prophetic words of revelation. God uses casual conversations between believers. God uses counseling sessions. God uses one-on-one -on -one meetings called for the purpose of correction. God uses all kinds of events in the body of Christ, fathers and mothers, to rebuke us. How does God rebuke us? Sometimes God uses donkeys. <laughs> Titus is what we might call a donkey. He was just a letter carrier and he was unknown to the Corinthians. But the Lord anointed him specifically for the task. God's presence went with Corinth to Titus, uh, with Titus to Corinth, and God's presence returned again with Titus. There was grace on Titus to carry Paul's message, and there was grace on Titus to carry the Corinthians' response back to Paul. And just like Balaam's donkey, sometimes God anoints an unlikely messenger to deliver a rebuke to us. Someone who is unknown to us or someone who is unqualified in our opinion. But listen, whether God chooses to rebuke us through his word or through a spiritual father or mother or even through a donkey, the question is, will we receive his rebuke? Four truths that lead to the removal of regret. We have a good, good father. Because he's good, 
he rebukes us. You doing all right? You okay? You're holding in there pretty good. All right? You're doing a little better than most of the services this week. All right. Third, when we receive his rebuke, it leads to repentance. Beloved, everybody listen to me. Listen, listen. This is so important. When God delivers a rebuke to us, there follows a critical moment of decision. Will we receive his rebuke or will we reject his rebuke? Solomon pleads with us, my son, do not reject the Lord's rebuke. Don't take it lightly. Don't resent it. A divine rebuke puts us at great risk. If we receive that rebuke with humility, it will lead us to life. But if we refuse that rebuke, it will lead us to great harm. On the one hand, Paul the Apostle was confident that God's power was in the sorrowful letter. And he was confident that God was going to work through that letter. But Paul the man really struggled. He regretted even sending it because he was afraid that if the Corinthians rejected it, it would mean the end of their relationship. Rebukes are risky business. Rebukes are risky because the heart of the person being rebuked is already headed in the wrong direction. Cain brought a half-hearted offering to the Lord. And the Lord rebuked him and Cain became angry. And God said to Cain, Cain, you are at great risk in this moment. If you will humble yourself, if you will receive my rebuke, I will receive you. But if you harden your heart, sin is crouching at the door and it is waiting to devour you. God pleaded with Cain to change his heart. But Cain just wasn't able. <laughs> I'm sorry to do that on you. <laughs> Paul says in verse 12 that, that a rebuke, it exposes the condition of our heart. When God turns up the heat, is your heart made of wax? Is it soft? Will it melt in front of him? Or is your heart made of clay? Will it only get harder? Rebukes are risky because their contents are necessarily and inherently offensive. A rebuke says you were wrong. A rebuke says you're not in charge. A rebuke says you have violated the rules of someone who is in authority over you. A rebuke says you owe someone an apology. A rebuke says that you must change course. Listen to me, rebukes are risky because no matter what the form of delivery, every rebuke is personally painful. Beloved, listen to me. Hear this. Hear it. Hear it. Hear it. No matter how gently a rebuke is delivered, no matter how loving the heart from which it issues, no matter how delicately worded it might be, any rebuke is painful. Paul went back and forth. What was the best way to confront this embarrassing incident? Originally, he planned to go back and visit the Corinthians in person, but he decided that he was so hot about it that a face-to-face -face confrontation would probably do more damage than good. So led by the Holy Spirit, he sat down and he wrote a letter instead. Most of the Corinthians received his rebuke, but a few took offense that he sent a letter. They criticized Paul of wimping out when he had said he would come in person. They accused Paul of talking tough in his letters, but being soft in person. You know, the truth is they wouldn't have re accepted Paul's rebuke in any form. Listen, we have this idea today that if we cause anyone pain for any duration and for any reason, that it's not consistent with God's love. Can I tell you that that is just plain wrong? In our bodies, God uses physical pain to alert us that something is wrong before that problem becomes unfixable or even lethal. 
I had a friend many years ago who had nerve damage and he had lost all the feeling in his feet and in his ankles and so every night he had to meticulously inspect. He wore braces. He had to wear braces to walk because he didn't have feeling that would regulate his walking and every night he would have to inspect his feet and his ankles vigorously to make sure there were no cuts, to make sure that there was no issues or infections because without feeling he could develop an infection that could kill him and he wouldn't even realize it in time. And the same thing is true of our spirit man. God uses the pain of a rebuke to alert us that something is wrong inside and needs correction. How many of you would agree that Jesus was the most loving man that ever walked the earth? Come on, you have to agree to that. He was the most loving man. Can I tell you that Jesus' presence caused people pain? It was temporary and it was purposeful, but it was real pain. When Peter realized who Jesus was, he became convicted by the power of his presence and Peter dropped to his knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. The Roman centurion said, Jesus, I am not worthy that a man like you should come under the roof of a man like me. I'm sure that the woman at the well felt real pain when Jesus said to her, go call your husband, knowing full well that she had been divorced five times and she was now living with a guy. The rich young ruler went away from Jesus in pain. And I feel like maybe the Holy Spirit wants to address someone here today. Maybe you have rejected a rebuke because of the form in which it was delivered to you. You don't know how she spoke to me. You don't know the things he said. I can't believe that rather than facing me face to face like a man, he wrote an email. I can't believe that she sent a letter rather than speaking to me. I can't believe that he was so insensitive with the timing addressing me like that. Is it possible that are you, you are using the form as an excuse to ignore what God really needs to say to you? Wow. Rebukes are risky. Because very often people shoot the messenger. Paul was not the source of the rebuke. God was. But Paul feared that the Corinthians might end their relationship with him. Titus was not the author of the sorrowful letter. But Paul feared that the Corinthians might mistreat Titus when they read what was inside. He was in Troas waiting for Titus to return to him. And when Titus didn't come, he had anxiety. He didn't know what the Corinthians had done to him. He didn't know whether they beat him. He didn't know whether they buried him, you know, like Jimmy Hofstra somewhere. They, he didn't know what happened to him. And even though the meetings were hopping, he couldn't even stay and minister because he was afraid of what they might do to Titus. Nothing bad happened. But the point is, delivering rebukes is risky business. <laughs> rebukes are risky because if they're not received, they will permanently harm the people to whom they were issued. Paul says, this is good preaching right here. Paul says in verse 9, if the Corinthians had not become sorrowful in a way that God intended, they would have been harmed by him. Paul contrasts two kinds of sorrow in these verses. One is sorrow according to the world and the other is sorrow according to God. You're about to hear the best preaching you've ever heard on this. So just listen. Beloved, every rebuke makes people sorry. The question is with what kind of sorrow? Some have suggested that worldly sorrow is not genuine sorrow. That it's crocodile tears if you will but I don't believe that for a minute. Some have suggested that worldly sorrow is purely self-centered, only pitying oneself for consequences and not thinking of others. I don't believe that either. The opposite of godly sorrow is not a lack of sorrow, but rather it is unproductive sorrow. Worldly sorrow definitely grieves over one's failures. 
definitely grieves over the wrongs one has committed. It, it, worldly sorrow definitely includes remorse over hurting others, causing loss. It, it includes regret over wasted opportunity, wasted potential. It includes genuine shame, genuine guilt, genuine wishing for change. Worldly sorrow is just as personal and just as intense as godly sorrow. Where worldly sorrow comes up short is in acknowledging that God is the one against whom all sin is ultimately committed. Worldly sorrow is rooted in stubborn disbelief and so it pushes people even further towards hard-heartedness. Worldly sorrow fails to acknowledge that all the wrongs that we commit against others, we ultimately commit against God. It refuses to approach God in humility and repentance and so fails to secure his mercy and grace. So in the end, worldly sorrow is unproductive. It is real sorrow, but it leaves people hopelessly sorry. It, it is real sorrow that leaves people trapped in guilt and shame and grief and mired in regret for the rest of their lives and in the world to come. Yeah. Rebukes are risky, but they're worth it. Because if they are received, they result in repentance. In contrast to worldly sorrow, there is godly sorrow. Godly sorrow looks past the messenger. Godly sorrow looks past the form. Godly sorrow looks past the offensive content of the rebuke and it sees that God is at the source. Godly sorrow is a moment of divine revelation that restores spiritual clarity. Godly sorrow pushes us back towards God. It leads to repentance. It acknowledges that He is the one whom we have transgressed. It, it, it pierces our heart sharply because we realize that we have hurt a good, good Father. Godly sorrow says, God, I'm sorry. I think that the finest example of godly sorrow in the Bible is David's response to the rebuke that the prophet Nathan brought him. David's prayer of repentance is recorded in Psalm 51. You know it. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity against you and you alone I have sinned. Now truthfully, David had sinned against many, many people. David sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against her husband Uriah, who he murdered. He sinned against his general Joab for making him an accomplice in murder. He sinned against the entire Israelite army. He sinned against the child that was born from his union with Bathsheba. He sinned against his whole family, present and future generations. He sinned against himself. He sinned against the entire nation of Israel. But listen, all sin is ultimately directed at God himself. He is the one being defied. He is the one being denied. Whatever we have done to another person, we have done directly to him. And until we sort it out with him, we can't sort it out with anyone else. Godly sorrow recognizes that. It receives that and it responds to that. Four truths that lead to the removal of regret. You still with me? Yeah. Alright, because we're almost done. We have a good, good father. Because he's a good father, he rebukes us. When we receive his rebuke, it leads to repentance. And finally this, listen. Repentance leads to the removal of regret. Worship team, come and help me. Repentance leads to the removal of regret. Beloved, worldly sorrow is genuine sorrow, but it just remains sorry. But godly sorrow leads us to take positive steps forward. When Titus arrived with Paul's letter, the Corinthians received the Lord's rebuke. They received Titus, even though he was just a donkey. They received Paul's letter, even though Paul didn't come in person as he said he would. They received the conviction of the Holy Spirit with humble hearts, and they repented. And repentance opens the door to God's saving power. In verse 11, Paul uses seven words 
to describe the completeness of their repentance. Seven is the number of completion. Paul is saying with these seven words, their repentance was entire and complete. Repentance made them earnest to restore their damaged relationship with their father. Repentance made them eager to change course. Repentance made them indignant at the enemy who had led them astray. Repentance made them fearful of the danger that they had flirted with. Repentance made them long to be restored to right standing with God. Repentance made them zealous for the Lord again. Repentance made them committed to bringing to justice the one who had led them astray and rooting it out of their community. Paul says in verse 11 that through repentance, God's saving power was released. And listen, their innocence was restored and regret was removed from them. Do you know something cool about the sorrowful letter? Listen, listen, because we're done with this. Listen, listen. You know what's cool about the sorrowful letter? It's gone. We have all of Paul's other letters. We have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. We have Ephesians and Galatians and Colossians and Philippians and Romans and Titus and Timothy. We have all kinds of letters for Paul, but not this one. You know why? When the Corinthians dealt with it, when they turned to God and they repented, God removed their guilt and he removed their shame and he removed their regret and there was no need to hold on to that letter anymore. And beloved, that's exactly what repentance does in our life. Even though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. I did regret it. I see that you were hurt, but only for a little while. And now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorry as God intended. And so you were not harmed by us in any way. Worldly sorrow brings death, but godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. There is a remedy for regret. There is relief for regret. There is a way to remove regret. We have a good father. Because he's a good father, he rebukes us. And when we receive his rebuke, we repent. And repentance leads to the removal of regret. Come on, stand on your feet. I want you to give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this.